though she was actually bringing it on herself by not treating herself. She had high blood pressure, but she could be treated. Uh, and the reason she was doing this is she was like one of ten children, and she had to take care of the father in the home. The other nine lived in Austin, Texas, but they didn't want to take care of him because he was mean, he was abusive, and she was the last one on the totem pole, so she got the short straw, and so she had to take care of him. So her being sick on purpose was her cry for, get me out of here, I don't want to be here. So after that, social services kind of started working with that whole situation to get settled down. But that's a case where you had terrible blood pressure control because the person voluntarily chose not to do things. It was not a here, it was on a high level. Okay, so you just have to know those stories are out there, and there's plenty of them, plenty of them like that. Um, hypotensive symptoms with medications and people describe you really lightheaded dizzy while they fall and you can't figure out what it is and you think your, your medicines are at a, at a reasonable level or even lower. You can evaluate that. Episodic hypertension, some people have, can have that. Or autonomic dysfunction. I know y'all haven't had diabetes yet, but you can end up with autonomic dysfunction and have all kinds of regulatory issues with blood pressure uh, not responding naturally, normally. I know Dr. McNeil talked to you about the normal regulation of blood pressure and, you know, when you change positions, you have sympathetic nerve output, you know, to kind of tighten up blood vessels and increase heart rate. When you are a person with diabetes and even some other disorders, that autonomic nervous function might be abnormal, not function right. So you can stand up and your body, and your, uh, get up like this, month, month. Heart rate doesn't just a tad bit, and my blood vessels tighten up, and I don't fall down. They get up, stand up, and nothing fires, and then they just get lightheaded and fall over and hurt themselves. So you'll you'll see more of this as we as we creep in. Um, so, and I talked about the measurement device that need to be checked. So that's just a little bit of an overview of, of blood pressure checking. Some of the factors that can play into it. Just be aware that they exist. You're going to have to function within the environment you're in. But be suspicious when things don't work properly. Go back to the root. How, what is the reading? Is it accurate? Is the person doing what they're supposed to do? What are the conditions of the measurement, et cetera? Okay, and that'll, that'll serve you well to be a detective and to be suspicious. Okay. Okay, so let's look at patient evaluation. What do you do in patient evaluation? There are three objectives for patient evaluation for hypertension. You want to assess lifestyle and identify other cardiovascular risk factors because they can operate in conjunction with high blood pressure to put you at significant risk for cardiovascular or cerebral vascular events. Um, they will indicate something about the prognosis of the patient and also help guide treatment when you start evaluating what's wrong. Now, if you have a terrible diet, you're overweight, you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes and other comorbidities, well, your treatment plan is going to have to address lifestyle and the broadness of all these things and not just be high blood pressure medication type thing. And other conditions actually also dictate medication selection. Okay, so there are some, and we'll, we'll get to those as we creep in. Another thing is to reveal identifiable causes of high blood pressure. There are, you know, there's, there's two versions. There's primary or essential hypertension. There's no known reason why it's like that. It's just what you've got by inheritance. And then there are a number of other medical conditions that also have hypertension because of that medical condition. They actually originated. And that's secondary hypertension. So primary is there's no known cause that we, that we can identify other than genetics. And then the secondary cause is you can identify a, a, a disease that's, a, that's problematic. And then your final point is to assess for target organ damage and cardiovascular disease. So you want to figure out what their whole package and picture is, you know, when they have hypertension. You want to figure out if there's any calls that can be dealt with specifically and directly that will take care of blood pressure. And you want to find out has the high blood pressure already done something to that person. So you're, you're evaluating for all those end organ damages that could take place. Okay, let's look at major risk factors. This is one of the things that you identify in your history. And there's quite a few major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Hypertension is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Duh. Cigarette smoking, obesity, to be by definition BMI greater than or equal to 30, physical inactivity, 
Uh, dyslipidemia, <laughs> which is elevated LDL or total cholesterol or low HDL cholesterol or all of the above can happen. Uh, diabetes, microalbuminuria or estimated G, uh, glomerular filtration rate of less than 60. Just help me know if you had that defined for you yet. Have you had glomerular filtration rate defined for you? I know renal doesn't happen until the summer semester. I didn't know if Dr. Lotassi had mentioned it earlier on in drug dosing. Has it been mentioned a little bit? Kind of a little bit. I don't, I don't want to get off into the weeds with that right now. Just know that, that renal function um, or dysfunction as indicated by a glomerular filtration rate, how well is it? How well is the kidney working and filtering to do the job it's supposed to do, or spilling of albumin? Our risk factors all by themselves. And then age, men over 55, women over 65, and then family history of premature cardiovascular disease, and it varies among the men, uh, among the, the sex uh, of the relative. Males under age 55, female relatives under the age of 65. Um, I have highlighted for you and read the components of the metabolic syndrome. Have you all heard of the metabolic syndrome yet? Okay, it's called Oklahoma Triad. Another thing you might hear is the Oklahoma Triad. I think I mentioned that in clinic last week, and somebody's like, "What's that?" You know, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Uh, but those, but the ones in red are part elements of metabolic syndrome, and y'all hear more about this as time goes by. Some of these things I just want you to hear now. I don't need you to be all in the know about them, because they involve organ systems you haven't talked about yet. Let's look at some of the identifiable causes of hypertension, and there's quite a few. Uh, sleep apnea, that is a big one. You know, that when I was uh, growing up and going through all this training, Sleep apnea was not appreciated as a cause of high blood pressure. In fact, sleep apnea wasn't even really given much of a name. It would just be people snore at night. Okay, it's a problem for me. You know, spouses complained about it. Well, it's now been evaluated and looked at quite significantly, and there are problems in the brain stem that can that lead to you know from sleep apnea that can cause high blood pressure. Uh, you'll get more of this later on in the year, but Sleep apnea all by itself can cause high blood pressure and is a risk factor for heart attack, stroke. So when you've got a partner that's snoring, it's, there's a lot of things that can be going on. And if they start your apnea, it needs to be evaluated because it's an ongoing risk for something bad. Something bad could be happening. Uh, Drug-induced or related causes, and we'll look at some of, the, some of those here in just a minute. Uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, I gave you several of these, chronic renal failure, glomerular nephritis, nephrotic syndrome. All I need you to know right now is that chronic kidney disease can do it. You'll get more definitions of these other diseases later. But as I told you, high blood pressure can cause kidney disease. Or if you have these kid chronic kidney diseases, they can cause hypertension. Uh, another is primary aldosteronism. Now, y'all talked about that earlier, right? When you said primary aldosteronism, what? gland is the problem? Adrenal gland. Okay, and what uh, what does aldosterone do? Y'all remember, I know this is terrible because it will make you start pulling stuff together. But what does aldosterone do? Right, and water. It increases retention of sodium and water at what level of the kidney? Can y'all, if y'all can do that, that's, a, that's prize worthy at this point. <laughs> It's not proximal, and it's, and it's the tubule of what's the little, what's the little microstructure of the kidney? Glomerulus. So you've got the glomerulus, okay, a nephron, a nephron, glomerulus, proximal tubule, descending leukopenia, ascending leukopenia, distal tubule, collecting tubule. Okay, so you're looking at sodium and water retention is what aldosterone does. That helps us. I mean, we need aldosterone. If you don't have aldosterone, you've got a problem. So that's part of one of our regulations of blood pressure, salt, and water balance in the body. If you make too much of that stuff because of what, you have a tumor on the adrenal gland, you have a tumor in your brain that leads to it, okay, and we'll worry about that in endo, but if you have too much aldosterone, you're going to be holding on to lots of salt and water. If you put a lot of, hold on to a lot of salt and draw a lot of water, what's happening in the pipes of your body? 
Uh -huh. is going to, your expected pressure up unless they can just dilate and accommodate to all of that extra volume that you're going to have high blood pressure so that's another one renal vascular disease there's referring to renal arteries and maybe even some of the microcirculation inside nephrons uh, you can have stenosis a little you know did have y'all talked about renal artery stenosis has that come up a little bit where did it come up did Dr. O'Neill bring mention it? He probably talked about it because it will be hard to talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and not try to link it to renovascular uh, stenosis. Well, you can get a little stenosis, a little narrowings inside the renal arteries, and when that happens, a whole cascade of events can happen beyond that. It just sets off the renin angiotensin aldosterone system so that at the end point, you're re you have more aldosterone retaining more salt and water. And the prime event is a stenotic lesion inside a renal artery or both renal arteries. Okay, just hold on to that because y'all have, have to study your phys and, and pathophys up to this uh, point again. Chronic steroid therapy or Cushing syndrome. Okay, now Cushing syndrome is an excess production of cortisol. It can be primary, secondary, tertiary. But if you have it, and, and using chronic steroid therapy like just prednisone, medrol dose packs that are absconded and taken, what do they end up doing? How does, how does Cushing syndrome uh, or chronic steroid therapy uh, cause you to have high blood pressure? Mm -hmm. It's well, it's, you know, chronic steroids, you know, there are, in steroids, there are glucocorticoid effects, there are mineralocorticoid effects, and when you take an exogenous steroid like prednisone, they have varying degrees of mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid effects. The mineralocorticoid effect is like aldosterone, it causes salt and water retention. So if you're making too much cortisol in a person's body, you're going to have some of this uh, uh, excess production as well, and, or activity. So it ends up causing salt and water retention. And it's an issue for patients you see taking chronic steroids. That's one issue. Other issues will be blood sugar control when you look at those. So the chronic steroid therapy, Cushing syndrome, kind of in the same ballpark. Salt and water retention as the end point, and that's how blood pressure goes up. Uh, theochromocytoma, have y'all heard of that before? Isn't that fantastical? Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a, a, a Theo? Never seen that. Have, have you ever seen a, a Theo? It will be on your board, though. I have, seen, I have seen a patient or two who actually had Theochromocytoma, and I'm 60, okay? They're, they're, I'm not going to give their age, but they're not 60. Okay, they're, they're youthful. So they've been around, but you don't see them a lot, and when they do see the show in the primary care practice, they would usually get referred over to people who do more eva advanced evaluations. I'm not going to ask you to remember all the details of this. All you need to know is that they are tumors, and they can be dispersed around the body in some interesting locations, that's what we need to know at this point, and they release uh, catecholamines. Name me a catecholamine. Epinephrine. Epinephrine. Okay, what's epinephrine do? The increased heart rate, what does it do to tone of blood vessels? It constricts. Okay, so if you have this little tumor around and it just releases catecholamines when it wants to, you can have episodic hypertension. Um, and they are hard to detect, okay? They're hard to detect because the tumor doesn't always release catecholamines all the time. Just don't worry about it. Just, just listen to me. Just don't. I'm not test this. But, they're hard to pick up because they don't release the catecholamines uh, at a continuous level in a number of patients. So you'll have an activity and they'll burst them out and then you'll have this high, high blood pressure, headaches, sweating, kind of not right, and then you'll kind of calm down. Blanch, white, I mean there's a lot of things that can happen. So when people give you these weird stories, or if you had the ambulatory blood pressure monitor on, and it just runs really good and all of a sudden you get these crazy spikes when you go back to normal again you have to start thinking what's out there that's making that happen. Uh, so they're picked up and they're usually picked up by urine tests. You can screen for uh, metabolic products of catecholamines and there's levels you know, that, that will let you know when it's excessive. So just it's a, a catecholamine producing tumor that releases erratically. 
Okay? That's one of those episodic hypertension causes that we're talking about. Uh, coarctation of the aorta can be a problem. Yikes. Okay, have y'all seen coarctation? I haven't seen coarctation either. Um, oh, you're asking us. I yeah. <laughs> no, that's actually. Yeah, sure I have. How many, have you, how many of you actually seen? I've seen it twice. Yeah. And what was their presenting symptom? One was in, uh, obviously, their infants. If they're going to pick up on it, yeah. they need to be corrected. Um, the baby was just really irritable, and she had noticed that um, and just the extremities would become cyanotic at times. Mm -hmm. And there was an episode in the wow. And then, obviously, when you see it, it's just not sounding right. And yeah. Their blood pressures are great. And in adults, a lot of times they show up as dead. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then thyroid is your other. Uh, hyperthyroidism is a very common cause of hypertension. And obviously, if you treat that, you can treat the hypertension. Uh, parathyroid disease is another that also has um, hypertension as a consequence. So, uh, thyroid and parathyroid disease are identifiable causes. That's six months up. Drug induced, I'll give you a whole laundry list of things to look at. And these are important to rule out because they are usually easy fixes. Just look at them. Non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors like Celebrex. If you are non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs can cause hypertension, that's, that's an issue. And it's a problem for good control in some people. I've known people who were over-the-counter users of a good bit of non-steroid because they had bone pain or whatever, and it makes it hard to get their blood pressure control. So that's one. Uh, the street drugs, cocaine, amphetamines, other illicit drugs of that same category, they can cause increased blood pressure. They can cause a lot of things, increased heart rate. They can cause heart attack. Uh, they can kill you. But their amphetamine, cocaine, they have sympathomimetic amine activity, so they're going to increase heart rate and increase blood pressure. Um, so that's why you're always asking that direct question about street drugs on people, because if they're taking street drugs, uh, it's a huge element of their health and interpreting findings. And hopefully they will tell you the truth if you can't just look at them and tell that they've been doing some stuff. Sympathomimetic amines is a wide variety of those decongestants and anorectics. You know, anything over the counter for weight control to a large extent is uh, sympathomimetic. Uh, all the decongestant medicines, um, combos, um, can cause that issue. Oral contraceptives can cause high blood pressure, and they cause it again because they have a steroid nucleus, so they can cause salt and water retention. So the, the estrogens can do that. Um, Adrenal steroids like prednisone, we already talked about that. Uh, cyclosporin, have y'all had that mentioned to you all yet? I think cyclosporin is an anti-rejection drug used for a lot of transplant issues, can cause uh, problems. But of course, you're not going to not use it in transplant, but it's, you have to treat blood pressure around it. So you have to titrate therapies. Erythropoietin, have y'all had that before? Y'all better say it because Professor Roark is sitting back here. I know, yes. I know he and Jeanette somebody talked about <laughs> erythropoietin. Okay, if that's being used therapeutically because it's a therapeutic agent, then you oftentimes have to titrate around blood, you know, red blood cell production responses versus how much you've got going on, and blood pressures can go higher. It's another one. Licorice. John on that? No. Licorice is, you know what the you know what licorice has in it? It has mineral and corticoid activities. So it can cause salt and water retention and it is true. I y'all will die of this. When I was when I was your age, there was a patient who was admitted into a acute care setting in heart failure. And they were in heart failure because they were a big licorice eater. I mean like bags. I mean, you have to like licorice to eat what this person would eat. I actually like licorice. Like, I could probably do that, but I don't. But this person ate bags of licorice a day because they liked it and had so much mineral or cold cord activity off of doing it that they, were, they had tipped themselves over into heart failure, believe it or not. Okay. I mean, if you have, if you have, it, it all depends. 
depends on how much reserve your body has to accommodate to flow retention from heart failure, how advanced it is. This person was a more advanced heart failure person, and if you're that situation and you eat like a bag of it, like you get at the movies and it's kind of licorice and stuff, that might be enough. Now, if you're a person like yourself and your physiology is otherwise normal, then you accommodate to these things you eat so it doesn't show up. He just didn't have a margin for error, so it showed up. Can you uh, a company? A company? Well, I don't know. They put, I don't think they're going to put on. I think when it comes to food, if we're going to sue food companies for causing medical conditions, every sugar producer out there would be in trouble. Okay. It's, it's voluntary. Is there a warning on the bag saying that? No, there's, you know, good question with answers. I, I think probably no. Well, there's a window right there. There you go. And then, <laughs> just sue them out. And then the last one of uh, agents that can cause problems, there are some OTC dietary supplements. And y'all will be getting little pieces of info all throughout this program as you go along about over-the-counter things that people buy. And I don't know if you're a GMC food store advocate, but people can go buy supplementary things. And three that are particularly problematic for hypertension, ephedra, ma huang, and bitter orange can cause higher blood pressure. And a lot of people like to use those things. So when you're asking people, what else do you take, they will give you over-the-counter things. If you push along, you have to go another step. Do you go to health food stores? Do you have other things? Back up everything. Red Bull. Red Bull, yes. How many monsters do you drink a day? How That's many Red Bulls do you drink a day? You'll be shocked at the amount that people drink that drink those things. It's, 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 it's a hype-you-up type thing, and anything that's hyping you up can mess up your blood pressure. There's no Red doubt Bull about it. Red Bull gives you wings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.